Hello, it is I, Dr. Brian Lorgan 111, and today I am the Mario Maker. It's a me, Mario. Get it? I made Mario appear, therefore I am the Mario Maker. And today, in today's episode of Learning Command Blocks, we are going to learn how to do, how to make something like this, make scripted events where things happen over time, which will be interesting because up until now, we've only learned how to either make a bunch of commands run all at once in a row, like these command blocks that say A, B, C, D, E, or make things run in a loop 20 times a second, such as this command block right here that's running after the purple that just keeps seeing loop over and over again. What we haven't learned to do is something you probably know how to do using kind of old school redstone, things like repeaters. I could set up some repeaters over here and print this out and it says one, two, three, four, five, but there's a little bit of a delay in between each of those commands. And so what we want to do today is move into the modern day, into Minecraft 1.9 snapshots and figure out how we can create a command block that does the same thing that repeaters would do back in the day, which is to create a delay between different commands so that I could do the same kind of thing over here and run this again and print one, two, three, four, five only with a delay among the commands. And so we're gonna learn about that today. So let's get started. Potato chips. I am back now in our learning command blocks world because that's what we need to do, some learning. And to start things off, I want to teach you guys about scoreboard tags, which can be used to identify particular entities in the world. So as we've seen before, I could summon an armor stand, and we know from drawing the checkerboard and Serpinski's triangle, we know that we can move things all around. I could say teleport at E type equals armor stand, tilde one, tilde, tilde, in order to move it one space in the X direction, just like that and it will teleport the armor stand, which is pretty great. But something you may be aware of that we haven't really discussed before is if I were to summon another armor stand over here, and then I were to run this command again, teleport at E type equals armor stand, tilde one, tilde tilde, both of these armor stands are gonna move because both of them match the entity selector in the command, this at E type equals armor stand. Both of these entities are described by that entity selector. And so we're going to move both of them. And so the question is, suppose I only wanted to move this one, but not that one. How would I do it? Well, there's actually, I mentioned when we first learned about entity selectors, or about at E, a few episodes ago, that it's actually a very rich mechanism. And there's a number of different ways that we could do things. For example, I could say type equals armor stand r equals 2 to only find the armor stands within a radius of 2 of where I'm standing. And then this guy moves, but that guy doesn't because he's too far away. Uh, so that's one way we could do things. But what I really want to do is teach you guys about scoreboard tags because they're very useful and versatile, especially in programming. And so let's go ahead, let's summon up a fresh armor stand. And I'm going to give this armor stand a tag by saying scoreboard players tag at E type equals armor stand add, and we'll call him Fred. Tag Fred added. So basically this armor stand has now been tagged with the tag Fred. And what that means is I could summon another armor stand over here. And then if I wanted to operate only on Fred, I could update my entity selector in this teleport command. Teleport at E type equals armor stand tag equals Fred to tilde one, tilde, tilde, and only Fred moves. And indeed, now that I have the tag, since that's the only entity in the world that is tagged with Fred, I don't even need the type equals armor stand. I can just say tag equals Fred, and we'll only move this armor stand over here. And yeah, you can have a number of different entities that have the same tag. If you do have a group of entities that you want to tag, and so, for example, I could add a tag to this guy as well and have both of these guys tagged Fred and move those two without moving this one. The tag mechanism is very versatile, but let's describe it in a bit more detail in terms of exactly how tags are represented in the world of Minecraft. Next up, let's learn another new command called entity data, 
which will allow us to see the data that's associated with entities. So I'm going to resummon an armor stand. I'm going to retag this armor stand as Fred, just as we did before. But then I am going to run entity data at e tag equals Fred to tell entity data to run in this guy. Open curly brace, close curly brace. And it's going to print a bunch of gobbledygook on the screen. The data tag did not change. And then all of this stuff over here. And these are all of the bits of data associated with this particular entity, this armor stand. And there's some interesting bits in here. For example, over on my cursor, invisible 0b. And right over here, you'll see tags 0 Fred. And so you'll start getting a sense of uh, how we just stored some data in this entity saying that he was Fred. And so entity data, if you run it with just empty curly braces, it just shows you what the current entity data is. But we could go and change some of the entity data. For example, I could say invisible, can I spell invisible colon one and poof, the armor stand has disappeared. And if we take a look at its entity data, entity data updated to, it's the same stuff except for invisible is now one. And similarly, if I ran the same thing again and said invisible zero, now it's visible again because invisible has been converted back to zero. And so entity data gives you a way to print out all of the data associated with an entity stored in its NBT data, as well as make changes to some bits of it, for example, invisible. And as we can see in here, oops, F3, get off the screen. As we can see in here, in addition to invisible, there's actually an array of tags. And so we could use entity data to actually set up tags on one of these guys as well. And so for example, I could say tags and then arrays are in square brackets. And let's give them two tags this time. Let's give them the tag A and the tag B, just like that. And now it says this entity data has been updated. And if we take a look at where my cursor is, tags, the zeroth entry is A and the first entry is B. So now this guy has two different tags to identify him. And as a result, if I try to run this command again, Nothing happens because the command I just tried to run is looking for tag equals Fred, uh, and there's nobody there. But if instead, let's try to make him invisible. If instead I say tag equals A invisible, it turns the armor stand invisible because he is tagged A. And similarly, I could make him uninvisible by saying at E tag equals B because he's also tagged B. And so basically any one of the tags will match in the entity selector at E tag equals whatever, so long as that tag is among the many tags that a particular entity might have in its entity data, then it will match that entity selector for running commands. And so as a result, I could say teleport at E tag equals B tilde one tilde tilde. And since this guy has the B tag, he will be one of the entities that gets teleported one square to the side. Finally, you can put NBT data in an entity when you first summon that entity. We've actually kind of seen that before when we have summoned armor stands with no gravity. And so I'm going to do tilde, tilde five, tilde, and then I'm going to say no gravity colon one in order to summon a fresh armor stand that is going to hang in the sky. But additionally, I'm also going to give him a list of tags. And specifically, I'll just give him one tag called floaty. And so object successfully summoned. Sure enough, there's an armor stand floating up here in the sky, and he's been tagged with floaty as I summoned him, which means all future commands. I could go ahead and uh, address him using the entity selector. Let's do entity data at E with a tag. And so I can say tag equals floaty as a way to address that particular entity who's hanging up in the sky. And I could say, for example, no gravity colon zero. And now gravity affects the sky. And so basically by summoning entities with tags, we immediately get a name or a handle or a way to address that particular entity. And that is going to be very useful because it's very useful to be able to act on a particular entity in the world rather than all the entities of a particular type. 
I'm now in a fresh copy of the learning world because I want to show off what could go wrong when you don't specifically address particular armor stands. This is the Srpinski triangle drawer that we made last time, and it's just teleporting all armor stands under the assumption that this one armor stand, who's kind of like the cursor of the drawing thing, is the only armor stand in the world. And so long as that assumption is true, everything works fine. But you may recall that we have other things that use armor stands in this world, such as Nudgy. And so recall that I could use nudge Z in order to nudge these blocks over uh, or to nudge them back. And nudge Z works, it's pretty self-contained and works all on its own. But if it's the case that this thing is running and teleporting all armor stands all the time, and I try to run nudge Z at the same time, which also uses armor stands, then all manner of ba bad things might happen. Uh, in this case, it didn't nudge things. And... I think something actually just happened above me in the checkerboard pattern over here. Uh, can I replicate that? Let me put some more blocks over here uh, and try to run Nudge Z again. All right, it did not move any of these blocks. Yeah, and it did weird things to the checkerboard up here. So basically, we've completely broken Nudge Z by virtue of the fact that this guy is teleporting all the armor stands in the world rather than just the armor stand that he is responsible for. And so in terms of a best practice when programming with command blocks, I would suggest for any entities that are going to be long-lived entities that you're going to be doing a number of things with, make sure you summon them with particular tags and then address them with those tags so that you don't end up addressing all of the entities of a certain type in the world because doing so is very dangerous because it could interfere with other mechanisms that are also operating in the same world. So we've learned about scoreboard tags, we've learned that we can summon an entity with tags in it already, and we've learned that we can use entity data in order to see the all of the NBT data associated with a particular entity. As you might be able to guess, and I think we possibly have seen a little bit in passing in the past, in addition to entity data, uh, there's also NBT data associated with blocks. Uh, so for example, if I sit down this command block that says hi, I can have my cursor on this block and I can run block data and say tab, tab, tab to fill out three coordinates that my cursor is currently on. And once again, empty curly braces. And it will behave just like entity data, except on a block rather than on an entity. And here is the entity data. The data tag did not change. Condition met is one, auto zero, custom name at powered command, say hi. You'll recognize that one definitely, XYZ coordinates, control, success count, track output. Uh, these are all the things associated with this command block. And so if I change it to saying bye, and I run this block data command again, we will see that it now says command, say bye. Uh, and we can also update things just like we could with entity data. We could update the entity data kind of in place. With block data, we can do the same thing. And so I could change the command to say hello. And now I've updated the command associated with this block. And if I right click the peek inside it, sure enough, now it says say hello. So entity data allows you to see and change the data associated with a particular entity. And block data allows you to see and change the data associated with a particular block. So far, when we've needed to summon entities for our various programming contraptions, we've used armor stands. And when I first introduced armor stands, I talked about the various properties that they have that make them good for doing various command block programming, for moving things around in the world. And it turns out in Minecraft 1.9 that they've introduced another type of entity that's actually a very useful for command block programming as well. And it's called an area effect cloud. And so I'm going to summon an area effect cloud uh, let's do tilde2, tilde2, tilde. And if I do that, it says object successfully summoned. And it should be right here, and you don't see anything here. And the reason is it's not there anymore, because area effect clouds actually have a duration. They will expire after a certain amount of time. And so let's change things and say duration 100, which will be 5 seconds. Since ticks are 20 times a second, it'll last 100 ticks, which will be 5 seconds. So I'll summon one of those guys up there. But once again, even though it should be lasting for five seconds, we don't see it. And the reason we don't see it is they're also invisible by default. Uh, they don't have any kind of rendering thing by default. But if you hold down F3 and press B, uh, that will change things so that you can see hitboxes on entities, and it shows the direction that they're facing. And so once again, that's F3 plus B to toggle it. 
But basically, this shows the hitbox of this armor stand and shows the direction that the armor stand is currently looking. And so if I go ahead and try to summon that area effect cloud once again, aha, there he is. Uh, here is the area effect cloud who is looking this way, but he only lasted for five seconds. We gave him a duration of 100 and then he went away. Uh, let me give him a duration of a thousand so he'll last a longer time so we can see him on the screen for a bit. But area effect clouds like armor stands have a couple of properties that make them super useful for doing certain types of things. One is they have no collision. Uh, they can travel right through uh, players can travel through them and mobs can travel through them. There's nothing to collide with. They also don't collide with blocks and so an area effect cloud can like live inside of a block um, and that's not a problem. It's still there just fine. I can break the blocks all around it. Kind of doesn't interact with the world in that regard. Uh, they don't have gravity which means once you summon them in a certain place even if it's in the sky they're just going to sit there. And they have this duration. They have this age property which can be useful in and of itself. Uh, to both to make them kind of go away after time, as well as to kind of like make them automatically counting ticks in the scoreboard. Uh, our 50 seconds has expired on that guy, and so he just went away. But let me summon him again for a thousand ticks, another 50 seconds. And if I do, I didn't give this guy a tag when I just summoned him, but I'm going to do entity data at e type equals area effect cloud with empty curly braces. So we can see its data tags, the data tag did not change. And so if we look through the data tags here, at the very end, I will see age 350. And if I run it again, now age is 611. And so basically every tick, this guy's age is counting up. Now it's up to 755. And so that just keeps counting up and up until eventually it reaches whatever we set as the duration tag. And I can see it right here, duration 1000. And so basically once it reaches 1000 and it just did, then the area effect cloud disappears uh, because that's what area effect clouds do. What they actually do is they're meant for setting up lingering potions. So kind of like potion area of effect things where you could have, you know, like a poison cloud that was sitting here. And if you walked into it, you get poisoned and eventually it would dissipate over a small amount of time. But just like armor stands in terms of survival Minecraft are kind of made for hang hanging armor on them. Area effect clouds are made for lingering potions, but if you are a programmer, a Minecraft command block programmer, you don't use entities for what they were intended for in survival Minecraft. Instead, you use them based on the properties that they have. And the fact that area effect clouds have no collision, the fact that they float, the fact that they automatically age and expire is very useful for a number of contraptions, such as delays. Potato chips. So let's come back to this little Mario world. And you'll recall that we had some command blocks here that were behaving kind of like repeaters. And now it's finally time to take a look inside this command block and see exactly what it's doing. It is summoning an area effect cloud one block over in the Z direction with a tag N ticks later and an age of negative eight. <laughs> And somehow this is making these commands run in sequence after a little bit of delay. And the somehow isn't magic. I guess you could call it magic, but really what it is is it's these command blocks right here. So I have a command that's running in a loop over and over again. And it is running these three things. Let's take a look what they do. The first one says tag every entity that is n ticks later. And I can't remember if we've seen this in scoreboard commands before, but at the very end of a scoreboard command, you can look for specific NBT data, and it will only affect entities with that NBT data. And so we're going to tag everyone whose tag is n, uh, n ticks later and whose age is exactly negative one. That is an age uh, value that's exactly that as we count up. We're going to add the tag n ticks later done. And then... At every n ticks later done entity, we are going to say block data auto 1b. And then executed at that same entity, we're going to say block data auto 0b. And that's going to turn on and off a command block at that location. And so basically, we have an area effect cloud that I've given a negative age. So it's starting at negative 8 and kind of counting up towards 0. And right before that area effect cloud expires, it's going to get a new tag. 
And as a result, then these blocks are going to see that new tag and cause auto 1b to be toggled on a particular command block. And you may recall there's down here needs redstone and always active. If I turn it to always active, this will say five. And needs redstone versus always active. The nbt commands are auto zero and auto one, which we can see by looking at the block data. So if I do block data tab, tab, tab to look at the nbt data inside this command block, we will see that it is currently auto zero b, uh, zero, and it's just a byte. And so the b just means bytes. But in any case, it has an auto value of zero. If I toggle it to always active, and then I take a look at its block data, Everything else is the same, but now auto is 1b. And so always active means auto 1. And needs redstone oops, means auto 0. And so basically toggling between auto 0 and auto 1 is the same thing as toggling between needs redstone and always active. And whenever you set an orange command block to always active, it actually runs the command. You see, each time I've turned it to auto 1, or always active, it's going and actually saying five in the chat. And so now you probably have a good sense of how this mechanism works. Basically, I'm going to run this command and it is going to say one and then summon an area effect cloud with an age of negative eight. Area effect clouds automatically age. Their age increases by one every tick. So eight ticks later, eight twentieths of a second later, uh, this thing will dissipate. But before it does, seven ticks later, it will get up to an age score of negative one. And then this logic will kick in and it will execute at the location of the area effect cloud, which is inside this block. It will then execute auto 1b and auto 0b, which will quickly switch this guy on and off, which will cause him to say two and then make this one run, which summons a new area effect cloud over here. And a few ticks later, this one will wake up and say three and summon an area effect cloud inside this block. And so that is how we can kind of emulate what repeaters give us with command blocks, but they're much more flexible because repeaters, if you know how repeaters work, they only give you kind of four time settings, one, two, three, and four. Uh, with these, we can use any number that we want. And so, for example, if I wanted to wait five seconds between one and two, I could say age minus 100. And 100 ticks is five seconds. And so now it's going to say one, and then it's going to wait for five seconds before this area effect cloud disappears, and then say two, three, four, five, and the other ones still have the short delay that they used to have before. And you'll probably notice on the screen that there's these crazy particle effects. Area effect clouds give off particle effects, the nah, particle effects if their age value is less than their wait time. We didn't take a look at wait time, but it defaults to zero. And so we've got negative ages, but I think it's actually kind of cool to see the particle effects so you can see uh, where the area effect clouds are and how they're kind of like moving through the system or expiring in the system and then new ones get summoned. But the long and the short of it is by adding these four blocks into your world that just look for area effect clouds with an age of negative one and then cause the corresponding blocks to get block data toggled between one and zero, uh, you can basically create kind of repeater delays inside command block chains that then wake up the next orange in order to kind of start a new chain of commands. And we can do that then in order to run all kinds of cool scripted behaviors where things take place over a certain amount of time such as our Mario Maker over here, where we're summoning a zombie wearing certain pieces of armor who takes some time to walk around the corner. And simultaneously, we have a bunch of blocks that play sounds in order to play different notes at a certain kind of frequency and amount of time in between them. In general, in the early episodes of these programming tutorials, learning command blocks, I'm going to focus more on the programming and less on the Minecraft, but I know people will be curious about this. And so in order to play this music, I am using the play sound command in each one of these orange blocks to play a particular note. And you can change the particular note that they're playing, make the note sounds you know, lower or higher in frequency. Uh, by changing one of the parameters over here. Um, you can look at the details of how the play sound uh, command works, but basically it's just playing individual notes, and then there are certain delays, four ticks between these two, eight ticks between these two, eight ticks between these two, 
there's a long delay between the next 16 ticks between the last two notes of this little Mario riff. But that's all it is. It's a bunch of play sounds separated by a number of these different delay blocks that are all exactly the same, except for they have different age numbers right here at the end. Uh, and then inside a world where we have these command blocks that are always running. And so that's how the music goes. And this just kills all the entities in the world. Uh, but what we have over here that summons Mario and has him come around the corner uh, and talk to us basically summons a zombie at a particular location. No AI means he's not going to try to walk around by himself. Silent means he's not going to make any noise or like zombies always do. Tags Mario so that we can address him. And then a bunch of armor items, leather boots, leather leggings of a certain color, leather chest plate of a certain color, um, and a skull. Damage value three means a player head. Skull owner Seth Bling is a guy you may know who looks kind of like Mario. Uh, they're often confused in public. And then once again, we'll wait for three ticks and we will teleport him 0.5 blocks to the side, and we'll wait for three more ticks, and we'll teleport him 0.5 blocks to the side, and we'll wait for three more ticks, and teleport him 0.5 blocks to the side. And it just so happens that that is kind of a good speed of movement of slowly teleporting a zombie, that it just kind of looks like he's walking towards you, and whenever you teleport a zombie or some other walking entity while they're kind of along the ground, the game, as it's rendering it, just kind of like automatically does that walking animation. So it looks like he's walking over. And then at some point he makes a right turn over here because there's part of the teleport command that we haven't learned about. There's two other numbers you can give. Uh, one is degrees in this direction. And so he started out at zero degrees, and then he turns to 90 degrees, which is looking this way. And then the other number is degrees in this direction, up and down. Uh, and at the end, if we take a look at this little scripted series I have when he's talking to you, he kind of nods his head. He kind of looks down and looks up. And so if we go over to the end of this sequence over here, we'll see some more teleport commands. Oops. Uh, where... Yeah, we went from 90 0, which is looking directly this way, to 90 20, which is still this direction and this axis, 90 degrees, but then 20 degree down angle. So we went from 20 to 0 to 20 to 0 in order to make him nod his head a couple of times. As we said, it's a me, Mario. So I'm not going to explain kind of all the full details of those commands, but hopefully that gives you a sense of what's going on and how just by being able to teleport an entity around and have delays between different commands that run between different oranges that start other chains, uh, we can do all kinds of interesting things in terms of scripting little animations and making little cutscenes uh, here in Minecraft. So I encourage you to go nuts with this kind of programming. Now, you might try this yourself and discover that some things aren't working as expected. If I grab an empty impulse command block and say, say hi, it's currently needing redstone, and I say a block data of that block to auto 1b, which should turn it to always active and cause it to activate. Block data updated, but it did not say hi. Uh, there is currently a bug. I am currently in 15 week 37a. You can see at the top of the screen, uh, there is a bug in command blocks where the first time they're used, uh, they don't work properly. If I set redstone next to it, uh, actually, let me turn it back to it needs redstone. If I set redstone next to it to activate it like that, and now it says hi in the chat, um, and then break the redstone, now this command block will work. And so if I do this block data command, boom, it says hi. And now every time I try to toggle from auto zero to auto one, from needs redstone to always active, it will work properly and say hi. Uh, but in order to get it working the first time, you have to do something. Um, my recommendation to you to avoid this bug, this is a bug that Mojang knows about, uh, and Sarge says he's fixed it, and so the next snapshot, it should be fixed. Uh, but I, what I recommend to you is when you first get a command block, uh, when you first get an impulse command block, set it down on the ground, put redstone next to it to activate it once, then throw away this empty command block that you have in your inventory, and instead control click on this guy, 
which will now be a command block with MBT. Uh, it's still going to look, you know, empty in terms of all of its other fields, uh, but now it's going to be in the working state as opposed to the broken state that it is when you first put one down in the world. Um, and so just use this command block to build with anywhere you're going to build. Or if you discover that one of your command blocks appears to be broken, uh, just set some redstone down in it when it's in the redstone state so that it activates for the first time. Um, and yeah, I won't go into the details of the bug, um, but it's a simple bug and it should be fixed in a future snapshot. Uh, but in any case, that's important for any time you're trying to activate blocks with auto 1B because that's when the bug actually occurs. Potato chips. If you want to add this delay mechanism in your own world, it's really simple. We just need a purple followed by three greens with the commands that are here. Scoreboard players tags at E tag equals n ticks later add n ticks later done for anybody whose age is negative one. And then for anybody tagged with n ticks later done, block data auto 1b and then block data auto 0b is all that you need. Just always running in a repeating loop. And then anytime you want to introduce a delay, if we take a look at the white command up on the top, summon area effect cloud tilde 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 one, or more generally in the area of the block that we want to wake up after some time passes, tag it with n ticks later and give it an age of negative and however many ticks later you want things to run. Negative eight was my little example right here. And so we can see it actually working in an example over here where if I activate the orange block at the top, it will run this first chain, the first three command blocks. The orange one is empty, but it will say, say something, but after two seconds, summon an area effect cloud. Tilde, tilde, tilde one will summon an area effect cloud down inside of this orange block right here. That will wake up in time negative 40. 40 is 40 ticks is two seconds, since it's 20 ticks a second is how fast Minecraft runs command blocks. And so uh, two seconds later, this orange one will be activated and then say something else. And so if I run this, it'll say, say something, but after two seconds, say something else. And that's all there is to it in terms of doing things with delays. So to sum things up, we learned about four major things today. First, we learned about tags. We learned ways that you could tag an entity so that you could refer to a particular entity in the world rather than all of the entities of that type in the world. We learned about entity data that one could use on an entity, both to just kind of print to the screen all of its entity data associated with an entity, as well as to update some bits of entity data. Then we learned the block data command, which like entity data, goes and prints out the data associated with the block or allows you to update the data associated with the block, but works on blocks like command blocks rather than entities like armor stands. And finally, we learned about a new entity called Area Effect Cloud that, like Armor Stand, which has a number of advantages in certain programming things, Area Effect Cloud has a number of advantages in certain programming things as well, especially related to aging and delays. And we used Area Effect Clouds to make our delay mechanism. And I'm holding a diamond sword right here. I don't know if this is something that I showed off in creative mode, but um, yeah, if you are just trying to swing your fist to gesture at things, you will break them, uh, but they've made it in creative mode such that if you swing a sword at things, it doesn't break them. And so when I want to gesture as I'm talking at blocks, I will hold the sword so that I can gesture at these signs without actually breaking them. <laughs> but I'll go ahead and break them now, as well as this block, apparently. In any case, that's all for today. I hope, as always, that you guys are having a great day, and I will see you again soon for more learning command blocks. Bye-bye. But wait, there's more? I probably told some lies in this episode, but I think this episode is long enough already for today. So I'll just leave you there. Uh, go forth. I'm not going to give an explicit homework assignment, but if you like making music, you can always try to do something similar to what I did with the play sound. If you like animating mobs, you can try to do that. But I'd encourage you to play around with just trying to make certain events happen on kind of scripted delays, because there's a lot of fun things that you can do. Until then, see you next time.